This hearing will come to order. Um, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Um, good morning and welcome to this hearing of the Subcommittee on Research and Technology to explore the major challenges that have led to our national cybersecurity workforce shortage and the programs underway to address that shortage. Uh, a sincere and very special welcome to our distinguished panel of witnesses for joining us here today, uh, the effort and time you uh, took to write your testimony and obviously share your expertise. We're all very much looking forward to, to hearing from you. Um, almost every day we hear uh, news about security breaches, poor system design, and vulnerabilities disrupting businesses and individuals' lives. Part of the reason cybersecurity issues are so prevalent is that the demand for skilled cybersecurity professionals far exceeds the supply of those individuals. According to CyberSeek, a tool funded by the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE, as of last month, there are over a half a million job openings related to cybersecurity in the United States. That's job openings. That means nearly one in three cybersecurity jobs goes unfilled. There are many reasons for this workforce shortfall. Relatively few high school students have any exposure to computer science in the classroom, let alone cybersecurity. Even when students graduate from college with a degree in computer science, they often lack the cybersecurity skills and hands-on experience to fill job openings. We also recognize and encourage the multiple pathways to careers in cybersecurity, including certification programs and apprenticeships. On Saturday, uh, just this past Saturday, uh, I held a town hall back in Michigan on special education. And one of the excellent resources that was highlighted uh, was the Living and Learning Enrichment Center, a center for adults with disabilities that has also just recently partnered with Cisco and the Michigan Career and Technical Institute to start a cybersecurity certification to, to train adults with disabilities that traditionally present barriers to employment. In addition, the cybersecurity field as a whole lacks diversity, even more so than many other STEM fields. The math is yet again simple. Last year, women accounted for only 20% of the global cybersecurity workforce the global cybersecurity workforce. Women of color in cybersecurity jobs make on average $10,000 less than their uh, male counterparts. We cannot address our current and future cybersecurity workforce needs without recruiting and retaining more women and minorities into the field. All of our panelists have been leaders in addressing the diversity challenge, and we very much look forward to hearing your efforts on that front. It should not be a surprise that I'm excited to have NIST represented on this panel to talk about their leadership in building the government's and the nation's cybersecurity workforce. Truly, NIST has been a leader in, of course, setting the standards, the platform, uh, even reaching out to the Department of Defense and forming one of the first MOUs to set cybersecurity stan standards in the advanced manufacturing uh, uh, space. Uh, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology is, is also playing a critical role in cybersecurity workforce development across this National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE. Uh, we'll also discuss many of the important federal programs at the National Science Foundation, the Department of Homeland Security, and other agencies designed to educate and train the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. Finally, we will explore how partnerships between academia, industry, and federal and state governments are working to improve our cybersecurity workforce, humming and collaborating and working together. I am so proud to say that my home state of Michigan has helped to lead the way in developing education and training programs to equip 
our state's workforce, Michiganders, with the skills they need to pursue a career in cybersecurity. Governor Gretchen Whitmer and even her predecessor, Governor Snyder, have implemented programs like the Governor's High School Cyber Challenge and Girls Go Cyber to give Michigan high schoolers experience in cybersecurity. We will hear about some of those efforts today. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today to help us understand these challenges that organizations face, companies face to recruit a skilled cybersecurity workforce, effective education and workforce development programs designed to help these organizations meet cybersecurity workforce needs, and how federal agencies such as NIST, are partnering with industry, university, and states to have America lead the way. Thank you. At this time, the chair is now going to recognize Dr. Baird for an opening statement. Good morning, Chairwoman Stevens, and thank you for holding this hearing today and giving us the opportunity to examine the challenges, both public and private, that we're facing in recruiting and training cybersecurity professionals. And I do very much appreciate, and we all appreciate all of you witnesses being here today and taking the time out of your schedule to do that. But with the advances in technology and growth in the Internet of Things, uh, come the new methods that foreign countries and cyber criminals can use to attack and access, access our networks. So Americans' information is vulnerable, and we will hear today there is a demand for trained cybersecurity experts to identify and defend against cyber attacks. According to the data derived from job posting, the number of unfulfilled security jobs has grown by more than 50% since 2015. And by 2022, the global cybersecurity workforce shortage is projected, projected to reach up to upwards of um, 1.8 million. That's just two, two years away, so it kind of gives us a clue how fast and how demand this is increasing. So well-trained professionals are essential to our ability to implement proven security techniques. Institutions of higher education are working to create and improve cyber education and training programs focused on ensuring that there are enough professionals to meet our needs. I'm very proud to say that Indiana, did you catch that? <laughs> Indiana has several universities that are leading the way in cyber education and training. Purdue University, which is the home to the nation's first computer science department, hosts the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, which is serious. Serious. Yeah. Is one of the seven original programs designed as a National Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense, sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Agency. The Purdue program has produced 215 graduates with doctoral degrees in cybersecurity and 329 graduates with master's degrees in cybersecurity. Purdue University Northwest is home to another Center for Academic Excellence for Information Assurance and Cyber Defense Education. As of this fall, Purdue Northwest has more than 200 students enrolled in the cybersecurity major. Indiana is also very lucky to have two centers of academic excellence designed and designated as two-year institutions, Moraine Valley Community College and Ivy Tech Community College. These programs help us meet the growing demand nationwide for cybersecurity professionals at all skill levels. The Science Committee has an important role in supporting programs that are providing the skills and expertise needed to defend and support our systems from cyber threats. I'm an original co-sponsor to the Securing American Leadership in Science and Technology Act. This legislation takes important steps to improve America's cybersecurity capabilities. It makes strategic investments in cybersecurity research and development across federal science agencies. And it supports building up the NSF Scholarship for Service Program, Cyber Corps, to grow and improve the quality of America's cybersecurity workforce. Protecting American cyber systems is critical to our economic and national security. While these federal programs play an important role, industry has really stepped up and developed some initiative and innovative programs to address the cybersecurity skills gap that we're currently facing, such as IBM's New Collar Program. 
I would like to thank each of the witnesses for taking the time to be here, and we really appreciate um, your efforts and expertise. I look forward to hearing from each of you and provide an overview of the state of the cybersecurity workforce and recommend how the federal government can best work with industry and academia to meet this challenge. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. And at this time, the chair um, now recognizes our chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman Johnson of the Full Science Committee for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Stevens and Ranking Member Baird for holding this morning's hearing on developing our nation's cybersecurity workforce. And I want to welcome and thank our expert witnesses for that testimony as well. We spend a lot of time in the Science, Space, and Technology Committee focusing on the challenges in developing skilled STEM workforce for the 21st century and on exploring the ways in which the federal government can best address these challenges. While we need to develop STEM pipeline across the, all fields, there are particular fields in which the gap between the supply and demand is especially acute. Cybersecurity is one of those. Technology alone will not mitigate the many risks uh, that individuals, businesses, and government face in cyberspace. We need researchers who understand the risk as they evolve and can build new defensive tools. We need executives who, extend, who understand what is needed to defend their own organizations. We need technicians monitoring the systems on a daily basis. And we need many other types of cybersecurity jobs in between. The fact is we need to educate and train individuals in cybersecurity at all levels. And it requires not just degrees, but different types of certifications as well as continuing education for those already in the workforce. And finally, we need the general public to be well educated about cyber hygiene starting in our elementary schools. The National in Initiative of Cybersecurity Education, or NICE, was created under the Obama administration to coordinate and expand federal investments in a skilled cybersecurity workforce and a cybersecurity savvy public. Congress, led by this committee, certified NICE in the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2013. The National Institute of Standards and Technology is tasked with leading NICE. NIST is not traditionally an agency that leads on workforce issues. It is, however, an agency that leads on cybersecurity standards for both the public and private sectors. With its unique understanding and unsurpassed expertise in cybersecurity, NIST is the right agency to coordinate, to lead efforts to develop cybersecurity workforce for the nation. The Science, Space, and Technology Committee has been enacting cybersecurity-focused legislation since 2002, and we are planning to move additional legislation this year. I look forward to continuing to collaborate across the aisle and across committee lines to take a whole-of-government approach to cybersecurity starting with the workforce. In that regard, I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses and how the activities carried out under NICE can continue to be strengthened. Thank you, and I yield back. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Um, our first witness is Mr. Rodney Peterson. Mr. Peterson is the director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Prior to his position at NICE, Mr. Peterson served as the managing director 
uh, the EduCase Washington Office and Senior Government Relations Officer. He founded and directed the EduCase Cybersecurity Initiative and was the staff liaison for the Higher Education Information Security Council. Prior to joining EduCase, he worked two different times for the University of Maryland, first as uh, Chief Compliance Officer in the Office of the President and later as the Director of IT Policy and Planning in the Office of the Vice President and Chief Information Officer. Mr. Peterson is also the co-editor of a book entitled Computer and Network Security in Higher Education. Um, our next witness is Dr. Amberine Siraj. Uh, Dr. Siraj is a professor of computer science and the founding director of Tennessee Tech University Cybersecurity Education Research and Outreach Center and has served as the leader on several NSF and NSA education and workforce development grants. Dr. Siraj is also the founder of the Women in Cybersecurity Organization, an NSF-funded initiative to recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. Dr. Siraj's research focus is on cyber er, is on security in cyber physical systems, Internet of Things, situation assessment and network security, security education, and workforce development. She was a 2018 recipient of the Colloquium for Information Systems Security Education Exceptional Leadership in Education Award. After Dr. Siraj um, is Mr. Joseph Sawaski. Mr. Sawaski is currently the president and CEO of Merit Network, um, a, a nonprofit um, corporation governed by Michigan's public universities. Merit owns and operates the nation's longest, longest running regional research and education network, having been formed in 1966 by the University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and Wayne State. Mr. Sawaski and his team at Merit also run the Michigan Cyber Range, the nation's largest unclassified network accessible cybersecurity training platform. Prior to his role at Merit, Mr. Sawaski was the chief information officer at Wayne State University, uh, doing this from 2007 to 2015, during which time he also served on the boards of the Merit Network, the Detroit CEO Executive Summit, and Michigan Technology Leaders. He also worked at the University of Toledo for 22 years, and in his last position served as CIO. We are delighted we recruited him to Michigan. Our fourth witness uh, is Ms. Sonia Miller. Ms. Miller is the IBM HR Director for both IBM Security and Enterprise and Technology Security, two distinct divisions within IBM that require workers who have the skills and experience in cybersecurity to protect IBM and IBM clients. IBM Security has eight thousand employees, including researchers, developers, and subject matter experts focused on security and more than 10,000 secu security-related patents. Wow. Since 2015, IBM Security has hired nearly 4,400 additional experts into its security business. In her position, Ms. Miller is charged with ensuring both divisions have the skilled staff necessary to fulfill their missions. Wow, um, just an absolute fantastic panel. Um, as our witnesses should know, uh, each of you will have five minutes uh, for your spoken testimony. Be sure to put your mic on. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. And when you've completed your uh, spoken testimony, we'll begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. And for testimony, we're gonna start with Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, and members of the subcommittee. I am Rodney Peterson, the Director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, or NICE, at the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, known as NIST. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the role that NICE plays in interagency coordination for cybersecurity education and workforce issues and the challenges the federal government faces in recruiting and retaining skilled cybersecurity practitioners. 
NICE is a partnership between government, academia, and the private sector. Our program is focused on promoting and energizing a robust network and ecosystem of cybersecurity education, training, and workforce development. NICE fulfills this mission by coordinating with its partners to build on existing successful programs, facilitating change and innovation, and bringing leadership and vision to increase the number of skilled cybersecurity workers to keep our nation secure. To coordinate at the federal level, NICE Interagency Coordinating Council convenes our federal government partners for consultation, communication, policy, and strategic direction. This coordination provides an opportunity for the NIST-led NICE Program Office to communicate program updates with key partners in the federal government, as well as to learn about other federal government activities in support of NICE. The group also identifies and discusses policy issues and provides input into the strategic directions for NICE. Another means of coordination is the NICE Working Group. This working group has been established to provide a mechanism in which the public and private sector participants can develop concepts, design strategies, pursue actions that advance cybersecurity education, training, and workforce development. Let me share a couple of accomplishments from our current NICE strategic plan. First, NICE issued six awards to pilot regional alliances and multi-stakeholder partnerships stimulating cybersecurity education and workforce development. These regional communities, known as ramps for cybersecurity workforce, were designed to stimulate local economic communities to work together to rally education and training providers to meet local workforce needs. Second, NICE also awarded a grant to develop a website known as CyberSeek that was cited earlier today, includes both an interactive jobs heat map as well as a career pathway portal. The jobs heat map shows that there are over 500,000 open jobs in cybersecurity today across the United States. It further indicates that there are almost a million people employed in cybersecurity today. The map can be used to search for demand by state. For example, there are 8,760 open positions in Michigan alone, 5,603 in Tennessee, and 4,533 in Indiana. You can also use that website to search by major metropolitan area, either within a state or across state lines. So for example, the DC metropolitan area in which we currently reside has 64,089 open jobs. One of the challenges in cybersecurity education training and workforce development is having a common language. To meet this need, NIST published the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. The common taxonomy in the NICE framework can be used by employers to structure their workforce, develop position descriptions, or craft employee development plans. The NICE framework begins to demystify a career in cybersecurity by showing the variety of types of work roles that exist and the multiple career pathways for entering and advancing in a cybersecurity career. An update to that NICE framework is happening this year. During 2020, NICE is embarking upon a consultative process that will result in a new five-year strategic plan as required by the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act, and that plan will be informed by the community that we serve. As NICE develops its next strategic plan, a few trends are beginning to emerge. First, the need to enhance cybersecurity career discovery for learners of all ages. Second, to need, the need to transform the learning process to emphasize the multidisciplinary nature of cybersecurity and the multiple pathways to enter into a cybersecurity career. And third, the need to modernize the talent acquisition process to facilitate skills-based hiring that, that enables career mobility. All of these trends and current activities of NICE directly support the goals of the National Council for the American Worker. Established under executive order, the National Council is creating the first ever national workforce strategy. This strategy is promoting the importance of multiple pathways to careers, the essential role that employers play as part of our national education and workforce system, the need for companies to employ skill-based hiring, the need for greater transparency in the skills that companies need, and the return on investment of different learning pathways. NIST is excited about the accomplishments of the NICE program in addressing the future of cybersecurity education in the U.S. in order to increase the number of skilled cybersecurity practitioners that are helping to keep our nation secure. NIST looks forward to continuing to support the nation's ability to address current and future challenges through standards and best practices. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, and the members of the committee and subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today in this very important discussion. My name is Amberin Siraj. I was born and raised in Bangladesh, where my dad taught me two simple things, working hard and serving others. I'm blessed that this nation has provided me 
and underrepresented immigrant with an opportunity to serve as an educator, a researcher, and a leader. I'm honored to share with you today how we at Tennessee Tech are contributing to the development of the U.S. cybersecurity workforce. Reputed statewide for its undergraduate engineering education, Tennessee Tech is located in the city of Cookville in Middle Tennessee with a student population of a little over 10,000. Our computer science CS enrollment is increasing at a higher rate than any College of Engineering programs. Among the three focus areas in CS, cybersecurity has the majority of students, around 500, and its enrollment quadrupled in the last four years since it started. Operating since 2016, CROC is a center of academic excellence in cyber defense education, accredited by the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. At CROC, our cybersecurity students, we facilitated an integrated experience in informal education research and outreach activities alongside their formal cybersecurity education as part of the CS curriculum. With the mantra of continuous learning, crowdsource learning, and paying it forward, our students are constantly challenged to immerse themselves into educational experiences that enrich self and those around them. Over the last few years, multiple CIROC projects funded through the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense have impacted thousands of secondary and post-secondary students and hundreds of educators in Tennessee and beyond. Scholarship for Service, SFS, DOD CISP, and Gen Cyber are among these. One of our programs with great impact is the Women in Cybersecurity WCIS initiative. At the time when female representation of cybersecurity was only 11%, our journey began in 2013 with funding from National Science Foundation. Today, I'm proud to let you know that over seven years and $3.5 million funding from industry support, WCIS has provided approximately 3,000 student scholarship, 340 faculty scholarship, and 6,400 in attendance. Not only the flagship conference for women in cyber, WCIS has become, regardless of gender, the largest security conference in the nation that ensures comparable representation of students and professionals in the audience, both from public and private sectors. Operating as a nonprofit organization since late 2017, WCIS is more than 6,000 members strong, with 89 student chapters across 35 states, 15 professional affiliates across 20 states, and a suite of services to its community that includes students, professionals, educators, and veterans. There is yet a lot to be done. The current 20% female representation in cybersecurity is not just a threat to diversity and inclusion, but also a threat to the cybersecurity workforce pipeline. To bolster the cybersecurity workforce, I encourage Congress to invest in federal programs such as CAE, SFS, CISP, GenCyber, and commission more of such programs that enable educational and nonprofit programs to support diverse populations in cyber, community college pathways, preparation and pipeline of educators, and non-traditional pathways for workers. The support opportunities and resources provided by these federal grants are central to enable smaller schools like us to contribute in the nation's cyber agenda in our own ways, with our own strength, and through our own community and beyond. As we continue to do our part, I would like to end with a quote from one of our many students at Tennessee Tech who are hardworking, humble, and optimistic about their future and their country. M writes, this program has given me the courage to dream big, to continue seeking knowledge, and to make a difference in the world. 
I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I hope that Tennessee Tech, CIROC, and I can continue to be a resource for Congress. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Honorable Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to present Michigan perspectives on the critical issue of cybersecurity <coughs> workforce development. My organization, Merit Network, provides advanced networking, security, and community solutions to higher ed, K-12, libraries, and other nonprofits in Michigan. Given our mission-critical work across the state, we see firsthand the ever-increasing importance of cybersecurity and the desperate need to expand that workforce. Our country faces threats constantly from adversarial organizations, but quietly and diligently on the front lines are our nation's thin ranks of dedicated cybersecurity professionals. According to estimates, the U.S. has a shortfall of over a half a million security professionals. In Michigan alone, we have nearly 9,000 vacant positions now. These gaps are projected to widen. Over the last several years, Michigan has developed a unique approach to developing a cybersecurity training ecosystem in a powerful tech platform for practicing skills. The Michigan Cyber Range was created through a collaboration between the state, industry, and merit beginning in 2012. The Cyber Range is one of the nation's largest unclassified practicum environments for security professionals to test their skills at cyber defense. The range features a simulated city called Alphaville that contains a virtual city hall, school, library, and factory, among other things. In our gamified practice environments, Merit has engaged nearly 4,000 participants from Michigan and other states and even other countries in cyber exercises. Additionally, with the support of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, we've cultivated a statewide ecosystem of training partners called Cyber Range Hubs, helping them train and certify students in a variety of cybersecurity courses using the Cyber Range platform and its course curriculum. This program represents a novel augmentation of traditional higher ed and K-12 courses in the state. There are real challenges faced by our partner organizations in the education, government, and nonprofit sectors in recruiting a skilled cybersecurity workforce. The primary challenge facing nonprofits is an extremely low supply of available talent. This low supply results in high demand for employees, higher market salaries, and longer than average times to fill vacancies. Yet, nonprofits support a vast array of essential societal services and are still charged with protecting enormous amounts of confidential data. They face the very same cyber threats as other sectors, but their ability to attract cyber talent is constrained. Compounding this problem, finding qualified teachers and trainers for cybersecurity courses is really difficult, exacerbating the situation for nonprofits in the industry overall. There's consensus in Michigan that K-12 is the first key to improving the security talent pipeline. That pipeline starts in K-12, and it's essential that skill development and awareness of cybersecurity career opportunities begin at early ages. Given that this field is fairly new and rapidly evolving, there has not been a pervasive focus on it for K-12 students or teachers. It's imperative that we demystify and denertify cyber career opportunities to broaden the appeal of this career path. Additionally, we should expand student interest by providing more opportunities for underrepresented groups, including females and minorities, whose participation in the cyber workforce has been historically low. To help promote K-12 enthusiasm in cyber, Merritt runs the Governor's High School Cyber Challenge. Last year, we had over 600 students and over 200 high school teams participate, with the top 10 teams being invited to the final contest at the Governor's Cyber Summit in Detroit, and the top three teams being awarded trophies personally by the Governor herself. Through this exciting event, Michigan has celebrated K-12 cyber talent in every corner of our great state. Considering all this, state and federal government have a critical role to play in bolstering the cybersecurity workforce pipeline. One, they should increase support to programs aimed at improving K-12 awareness and skill development for both <laughs> students and teachers. Two, they should increase support for education, training, and certification, including early credentialing in both high school and college. Three, they should increase support for skill development for underrepresented groups to grow that pool. And four, they should incentivize coordinated efforts between academia, industry, and government. And to wrap up, I'd like to say that many organizations are only one cybersecurity position away from a major disaster. And it's essential that we all work together to develop and grow this now critical part of the U.S. workforce. Thank you for the opportunity to provide Michigan perspectives.
Chairman Stevens, Ranking Member Byrd, and distinguished members, I'm the HR Director for both our internal security and for our division that helps clients to protect against cyber attacks. IBM Security is the largest security vendor in the world. IBM manages over 70 billion security events per day for our clients, one of the largest security intelligence operations in the world. We have 17,500 clients in more than 130 countries, 8,000 employees, including researchers, developers, and subject matter experts focused on security and more than 10,000 security-related patents. Since 2015, IBM Security has hired nearly 4,400 additional experts into the security business and invested more than $2 billion in dedicated R&D. Although today's hearing focuses on cybersecurity, the workforce challenges for research are similar. Inclusion, alignment, and attainment are obstacles to both security, cybersecurity and the research workforce pipeline. To this end, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the committee for its very strong leadership and support of the National Quantum in uh, Initiatives Act. Now, to understand IBM security, it's important to understand the people behind the brand. Our cybersecurity experts have a broad range of skills, including researchers analyzing software for vulnerabilities, incident response teams, analysts who spend hours studying the tactics of cyber criminals, and a security operations center staff who guards us in real time from threats around the globe. New collar workers with skills, experience, and diversity, but lacking degrees, are a strategic opportunity for the cybersecurity workforce. Around two thirds of the US working age population doesn't have a bachelor's degree. IBM New Collar's approach emphasizes work-based learning and core skills like teaming and adaptability. It is a pathway to finding and attracting non-traditional candidates with diverse backgrounds and skill sets. To expand new collar pathways into our cybersecurity jobs, IBM is experimenting with a multitude of approaches to educate and develop the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. Over 220 pathways and technology early college high schools, so PTECs, are educating students in 24 countries with the participation of over 600 companies. Through PTECH, public high school students can earn both a high school diploma and an industry-recognized two years post-secondary degree at no cost to them or their families. While working with industry partners like IBM on skills mapping, mentorship, and workplace experiences and internships. IBM launched our apprenticeship program in October of 2017. Apprentices are paid while in the program, avoiding that student loan debt and earning skills to work in the tech industry right away. Finally, IBM is trying to tap into sources of talent that have been underrepresented in its cybersecurity. As others mentioned, for example, women are globally underrepresented in the cybersecurity profession at 24%, even lower than the IT industry overall. IBM is actively recruiting underrepresented groups through programs that seek underrepresented talent for a more inclusive workforce. IBM's effort to build the cybersecurity workforce proves to be working. Nearly 20% of our security hires since 2015 were new collar workers. IBM urges the committee to examine the following areas for changed government activity that will improve the cybersecurity workforce. One, introduce and enact companion legislation to S-2775, the HACT Act of 2019, as passed by the Senate Commerce Committee, and work closely with your colleagues in the Senate to pass a bipartisan proposal that will strengthen Americans' cybersecurity workforce and align education and training with the cybersecurity workforce needs. Second, Higher Education Act reforms, including passage of H.R. 3497, the Jobs Act of 2019, to extend federal Pell Grant eligibility of short-term programs, removal of restrictions that prevent students from using their federal work study um, with cybersecurity-related internships in private sector, and support additional pathways to careers. And third, explore P-TECH models. Uh, federal agencies should explore the P-TECH model for workforce development strategies they can implement. And expanding new, hire, new collar hiring. The federal government should adopt a new collar approach to real and expanded sources of labor. Uh, so thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to present IBM's approach to improving cybersecurity education and your consideration of this testimony. I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, we've done a few things in this space, and um, you all touched on some, some great points. And um, at this time, we're um, going to leave the, the record open uh, should any uh, other uh, member have a, 
uh, statement uh, to make. Any other additional opening statements will be added to the record at this point. And at the at this time, the, the we'd like to uh, open up for five minutes of questioning, and the chair is going to recognize herself for five minutes of questioning. So we can we can start the clock now. Um, you know, it, certainly we've we've taken some steps just in the last couple of weeks uh, with uh, Chairwoman Johnson's support. We launched the uh, first ever Women in STEM Caucus uh, in, in Congress. Uh, Dr. Baird and I got a uh, bill signed into law uh, at the end of last year, the Building Blocks of STEM Act, uh, which is again supporting those early childhood investments and uh, in educational programming for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that continuity, as we all know, is so important, right? That, that on-ramp, the pathways, your your testimonies all, all specifically touch on that. M Mr. Peterson, I just wanted to, let's, let's understand a little bit about more about NICE here. NICE within NIST, within the Department of Commerce. Um, how, how big is your department? So we are a small team of five full-time employees, and we have an approximate $4 million budget appropriated by Congress, so a relatively small organization. Okay, great. Well, we'll be going through the budget reauthorization and, and taking a look at that and making sure. So the just this half a, less than half a dozen of you um, developed the CyberSeq tool, or did you contract out for that? So, so that was a grant given okay. to CompTIA and Burning Glass to actually oh, develop the tool. Okay, yes. Burning Glass. Mm -hmm. that, that was, oh, they're great. They're fabulous. Well, that's a big accomplishment, and, and we're glad to share that today, and um, we'll, we'll continue to share that. And is that on the NICE website? Is that available? There's a link to it, but it's okay. CyberSeq.org. CyberSeq. You can find it. Mm -hmm. CyberSeq.org. Okay, great. And as part of that heat mapping process and you know as we look to get in front of this we and Ms. Miller you, you probably know this all too well um, which is that the the job profiles are always changing right so we'll, we're seeking to hire for certain roles we we know we have an emphasis on cybersecurity, but with IIoT uh, other advancements you mentioned quantum the nature of the work is changing have have any of you explored or seen how job profiling, taxonomy work, maybe in you know with some of the big placement agencies, Manpower, Kelly Services in Michigan, uh, has that is, is that impacted this cybersecurity workforce skills gap that we're experiencing? I don't know if Ms. Miller, you wanted to chime in there. Well, at IBM, we, we provide several assessments to candidates um, around personality, so it's testing for the softer skills, as, as well as learning agility, so a propensity towards lifelong learning. So instead of testing for a specific job, we're really looking for these kind of softer skills, as well as some level of technical capability. So, um, you know, jobs, there's jobs now that didn't exist 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have to have that agility in how you're assessing people. You can't just assess them for the job at hand. Yeah, and Mr. Swansky, are you seeing this, you know, the talent qualifications as described? Uh, you're working hand in hand with the universities and have had this great career in this space, but the job profiling here, I, I also think is something we want to kind of match up so that, you know, when we're entering into the workforce, we've got that pipeline nexus. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think what we're looking for are problem solvers and pattern finders uh, here, mm -hmm. regardless of sort of academic discipline. Um, some of the finest IT professionals I've ever uh, worked with were anthropologists and psychologists and others. So yeah. it's not absolutely necessary that computer science is, uh, you know, the, the first part of a background for a successful career in cyber. Great. Dr. Siraj? <clears throat> So, you know, if you go to the CyberSeq website, there is also an interactive pathways tab. And <clears throat> if you click on that, it shows that in reality, most of the da data shows that the top jobs are all based on computer science. But, you know, it is absolutely true that cyber is very multidisciplinary. And then we can have people coming from all walks of life to have something. I mean, everyone can contribute to solve a problem in cyber because cyber is so vast. Plus also, you know, the NICE NICE workforce framework also help with, helps with that because in that framework, 
um, Department of Homeland Security actually gave out a tool where someone can go in and say, okay, I'm interested in database and it will show that student or that um, person, you know, where in the NIST framework that this person can contribute to in what way. Yeah. Again, cyber is some, something that anyone can contribute to with their own skills. Right. And so, Mr. Peterson, I'm sure some of this is resonant with you. Do you see NICE being able to work with every one of our witnesses and their portfolio of work? And would our witnesses also agree that y you get a lot out of working with NICE and that department? So this five-person department in the you know, <laughs> Department of Commerce. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to comment, even though we have five team members, yeah. the NICE community is vast, and everybody yep. on this stage, every organization represented here has worked directly with NIST and NICE in the past in, in our national efforts. So our Leveraged partnerships. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm slightly over. I'm going to yield back the rest of my time and recognize my colleague, uh, Dr. Baird, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate I've uh, gained a great deal of insight just having you here today. And I'm sure those that are listening and, that, and read the reports will also feel the same way. Uh, but, Ms. Miller, uh, I had, I see in your testimony you said you handle 70 billion security events per day for your clients. I mean, that. Well, not me personally, but yes, <laughs> IBM Security does. I understand. So, so then I have a, a, an interest in veterans, and so they bring a wealth of skills from their military training, and then they, they got a lot of hands-on experience. Sometimes they do, they're not able to transfer their military training over into, over into uh, various programs. So I guess my question is, uh, what's IBM doing in their new collar program? Is that applicable to veterans? And then the second part of that, uh, have veterans participated in this program? Yes, absolutely. So um, we have a variety of programs targeted to veterans because they, they tend to actually be a very good fit for cybersecurity roles, whether they've worked in cybersecurity while in the military or um, they got requisite training once they've left the military. We have a Veterans Employment Initiative, so that's free training on IBM software, and it comes with a certificate at the end. We touch over 100 veterans per year with that program using IBMers donating their time. Um, we also have a corporate partnership with the U USC Marshall School Masters of Business for veterans. So we have IBM mentors, advisors, and SMEs donating their time to work with the veterans on capstone projects. So basically developing innovative solutions to real world issues. And finally, we're also hiring veterans at all levels um, in, the, in the company um, and in this, the security organization. I actually in January was down in Austin and we have a cohort of apprentices that uh, started in uh, the first quarter of last year. 50% of those apprentices are veterans. One actually worked in cybersecurity while in the military and then applied through the apprenticeship program once going private sector. Um, another one actually left the military. He worked for 10 years as a corrections officer, decided to use some of his military benefits, and now he's in our apprenticeship program. They're um, hardware hackers, and they're doing excellent. Super. Then my next question uh, goes to all of you. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that Indiana's got four cybersecurity centers for academic excellence, and I'm having fun with the chair about Indiana and Michigan, but, but in reality, uh, I'm just using them because I'm familiar with it. So the question comes down uh, to how the federal government can further build on programs like they have at Purdue, and, and, and someone mentioned more uh, like a two-year program and so on. So. I guess, I guess I'm just asking how we as the federal government, uh, giving you the opportunity to expand on how you think we can be helpful in those, those uh, area, in that area, and to fill this half million job need we have. And so this is gonna be ladies first. Uh, Raj, you go first, and then Ms. Miller, and then back to Mr. Peterson. So, you know, as I said in my testimony that programs like the CAE, program that is uh, NSA DHS program, programs, uh, NSF programs like Cyber Core, DOD program like Cybersecurity Scholarship, Gen Cyber program, 
I mean, all of these program has been so impactful to, um, I think the best thing about these program is that it enables smaller schools to uh, have resources to, to build army on the ground. And then, you know, once we have all these uh, institutions making change in their own community, then collectively we are going to see so much in the nation. So, you know, um, empowering this program, again, NIS NICE has been extremely crucial in for uh, universities to get the momentum going. Uh, and also commissioning more programs like this that looks at how to train educators in cybersecurity because that is uh, the biggest challenge. Um, in 2018, there were 114 um, PhDs in cybersecurity and only 14 of them went to universities as faculty. So if we want to build pipeline in universities for students, we have to find some ways to train and prepare uh, and allow educators to go into universities. I see I'm over on time. Yeah. Is it all right if I go ahead yeah, or they go ahead? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, the Higher Education Act, I talked about reforms there. Um, re really removing the obstacles on how people can use the funding students um, so that they're not pushed into having to go through a four-year degree. So I talked about work-study programs and using their benefits to work in the private sector in a field that's, uh, that's relevant um, for their, uh, their career aspirations, um, as well as using Pell Grants for shorter education, um, you know, cert certifications and things like that versus the four-year degree. I think is really important where we really could use some help there to help students. So I, I think what NICE and NIST is best at is convening communities. And so a lot of our work is at the national level. We actually convene an annual K-12 conference to bring together K-12 educators and administrators from across the nation. We do our own annual uh, NICE conference. It brings together industry, academia, as well as government. Uh, we also collaborate internationally. There's quite a few other countries that are interested in adopting the NICE cybersecurity workforce framework as a standard, not only for their country, but because of the global nature of work. But we fundamentally believe that a lot of the solutions and the answers are in the local communities, whether it be a state like Michigan and the ecosystem that Mr. Sawaski described is exactly what we promote in Indiana in all of your different states, um, or at the local level, regional level, how that m might be defined. So when I earlier described that ramps for cybersecurity workforce development, that's really about regional alliances, getting the K through 12 higher education training ecosystem working together to meet local workforce needs. I think fundamentally uh, we need more funding to grow the you know cybersecurity workforce than we have now. I, I listen to my colleagues talk about you know graduating hundreds of uh, cyber pros at a time, and really we need to be looking at growing them at thousands uh, at a time. And uh, the notion of early credentialing, building on what Ms. Miller said, is really important. Um, I, I will let you know that my son Jared uh, was pursuing his batch, uh, bachelor's degree in computer science, and I strongly urged him to uh, obtain a uh, professional cybersecurity certification in his uh, sophomore year, and he did that. And he got a job, and he's actually uh, paying for his own school now. He's out of the house, which is nice as well. And, and uh, he's, he's becoming very successful with that early credentialing program in allowing students to support that early credentialing uh, in, formal, in normal degree pathways, I think, is really important. Thank you. Now you back. Great. And uh, at this time, we're going to recognize uh, Ms. Johnson for uh, five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess I can direct this to each of you. Uh, what are the major challenges that, uh, that have led to the uh, cybersecurity workforce shortfall? And what should Congress focus its future efforts on to bolster the cybersecurity workforce. <laughs> okay, so I will um, start. I think K-12 is the, um, is the you know, most impactful because there is really not so much activity in cybersecurity at K-12 um, and computer science. There are only 33 states now that have started to have some programming in computer science and 
Cybersecurity is much, much behind that. So preparing um, teachers in K-12, um, you know, provide opportunities uh, to students, like high school students, giving them internships in cybersecurity, doing partnership with educational institutions, giving infrastructure to K-12 so that, you know, uh, there is a trend right now that K-12 schools are being um, hacked. Uh, so they need to also, you know, strengthen their infrastructure. And uh, again, so that's K-12, and in post-secondary, there is um, so much to do. Uh, not many schools offer cybersecurity courses. I think the key thing is to not to treat cybersecurity as a silo, but integrate in computer science education, in STEM education. In, in fact, make it a general education course in universities. You want to? I think awareness is really important. Uh, a lot of uh, children in K through 12 aren't even aware that cybersecurity is an option for careers. And uh, I think in Michigan, with our uh, governor's uh, cyber challenge, that's really helped promote that awareness too. And it's been fun to watch people who traditionally haven't uh, thought about uh, career opportunities in that field really dig in and work with their teachers and, and local coaches. And uh, Merit, being a network provider, offers us as a cloud-based service so that we can reach every corner of our state uh, into underserved areas like Detroit, into rural areas like Marquette, Michigan. We've seen talent emerge uh, from those programs. So um, just to kind of build off of that, so two-thirds of high school students said um, they, the idea of a career in cybersecurity had never been mentioned to them by you know teachers and, and guidance counselors. So. There's one of our problems is that, you know, again, it's not being mentioned, it's not being thought about while they're in school. One of the things IBM is doing, focusing on this, is we actually have something called IBM Cyber Day for Girls, where we have um, some of our um, professionals um, in cybersecurity at IBM go out and meet with middle school girls to tell them about careers in cybersecurity, as well as go through kind of a workshopping day where they, you know, teach them about IoT, cybersecurity, hygiene, those types of things, to hopefully get them more excited about cybersecurity. So we're trying to, you know, kind of kill a couple birds with the uh, same stone by getting um, women or girls more interested in cybersecurity, as well as educating um, about cybersecurity. Um, I also um, also mentioned was we do need more um, curriculum, strong curriculum. Um, in community colleges and um, four-year colleges around cybersecurity, many do not have majors, minors, or any kind of program study and certificate that they can get in those areas. And I think that's going to be important as we continue to move on and um, focus on the skill set. And, and while NICE would certainly agree with everything that's been said in career discovery being critical, I would say in addition to young people, we need to focus on working adults. We need to focus on the transitioning veterans, veteran spouses, uh, military spouses, adults that are underemployed, unemployed, opportunity youth who are in that 18 to 25 age group who aren't currently getting an education or working in a job, because that's gonna be the long-term solution, but we have an immediate shortage today, and we have to focus on adults as well as young children to have both a near-term as well as a long-term solution. Also, if I may add, community college is a big part of the conversation because they represent most diverse body of students, so we must uh, find effective ways to create pathways from community college to four-year universities or find ways to get these community college students into industry because there are, you know, there aren't many jobs that will accept community college students with associate degrees in cyber. Thank you very much, time's expired. Um, at this time, we're gonna recognize Dr. Foster for five minutes of questioning. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to speak about uh, the Department of Homeland Security oversees a program called Cybersecurity Education and Training Assistance Program, or, or CTAP, that's run by the National Integrated Cyber Education and Research Center, uh, pronounced NYSERC. Now, CTAP promotes cybersecurity education at multiple grade levels in multiple states, including Illinois. It provides federal financial assistance toward community-based efforts uh, to increase knowledge of cyber security topics and to encourage interest in cybersecurity as an academic pursuit and as a professional career. Uh, 
CTEP has hosted uh, professional development workshops in both Joliet and Aurora in my district, and Joliet and Aurora teachers have attended professional de development workshops hosted by Chicago State University. Unfortunately, it's my understanding that the latest president's budget has zeroed out this program once again. Um, now, uh, Mr. Peterson or anyone else on the panel, uh, could you describe the CTAP program and uh, curricula and what makes it successful? So I, I am directly familiar with the NYSERC program as you describe, and as I just said earlier, we support a pretty broad, vast community, and I'm proud to say NYSERC is very actively engaged with us and, and with us with them as well. Uh, for example, they're regular participants and sponsors at our K-12 Cybersecurity Education Conference, which brings together educators and administrators from across the nation. And as you described, many states, many school districts, and many state departments of education are using their curriculum, and it's a way to get cybersecurity, as we heard described earlier, into the schools at a younger and younger age. Um, so we certainly appreciate the effort they've done to both raise awareness of the need to integrate cybersecurity across the curriculum in our K through 12 schools, and the way they kind of distribute the work that needs to be done across the United States by developing a common curriculum that they're trying to introduce in multiple states. Yeah, so there, are there many other curricular, curricula-based programs uh, for K-12, or are they mainly boot camps? So, so uh, curriculum happens in a lot of different ways. I mean, for example, at the high school level, there's career technical education programs or CTE programs, and there's career technical student organizations as well as other nonprofits that are partnering with the schools to both develop curriculum as well as to develop programs of study that the students can pursue to become more specialized or more aware of cybersecurity curriculum. I would say it's an emerging area, which is why NYSERC has certainly um, made an impact in both the number of teachers as well as number of students reached, uh, but it is an emerging area of opportunity for curriculum development at the K through 12 level, as I think we heard Ms. Miller describe. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I may add, um, the, I have seen firsthand the impact of NYSERC, and what NYSERC does, it, it trains the teachers, and not just you know computer science teachers, but teachers teaching math, uh, math art, sciences, STEM subjects, and it gives them resources so that they can talk about and teach security in their classes. So programs like that, I mean, I think they're crucial for the success of K-12 cybersecurity education. And, you know, um, I cannot say more um, better now, things about that we, program. We have an interesting situation in just STEM generally that uh, young women are outperforming young men all the way through the end of high school in STEM fields. And then in the first couple years of of college, it, participation's dropping off dramatically. I just, you know, when I go to robotics competitions in my district, which I do all the time, um, what, I, what I'm told is that all the way through junior high schools, the, the, the little girls and, and boys are, are well integrated, and then when you hit high school, for some reason, uh, the gender disparity emerges in strength. What, where, what's the situation in cyber security? Um, so as I stated before, you know, a couple of years back it was 11 percent. Now it's 20 percent. It needs to be 50 percent because, as we all know, diverse groups are outperform any homogeneous groups. But I think what's happening is, as young girls are getting into high schools and colleges, um, what's preventing them to be in cyber is the stereotypical image that cyber portraits. Um, you know, when you tell a young girl that, you know, if you go into cyber, you're just going to work in a dungeon and prevent attacks, that doesn't, you know, um, sound very promising. But if you tell the uh, young girl that if you work in cyber, you're going to keep peace in cyberspace, you're going to prevent chaotic um, situation in our modern day technological lives, that sp uh, speaks a lot. So I think the lack of community, the lack of inclusive environment, and the lack of role models. Yeah, the role models is something I, I've been told repeatedly in things like robotics competitions. For some reason, uh, most of the coaches in robotics teams in junior high school are tend to be women, and then that's not true in high schools. And so the role models maybe 
it's difficult to calculate, but it may be a huge effect. Um, anyway, um, Madam Chair, if it's possible if, to have a second round of questioning, I would, I would appreciate it if that's uh, feasible. So we were going to have the, before we brought the, the hearing to the close, we were, we were going to have um, the, the witnesses, as we're here in Congress, share a couple of minutes. But what we can do, Dr. Foster, is open it up for a second round. I'll t claim my five minutes and cede them to you. Very well. So you've done so? Yes. All right. Well, so, then, so I've so. yielded my time. Well, uh, thank you. To, to, I, I to my colleague. Um, I'd like to raise the issue of foreign workers um, in cybersecurity. In, in 1980, uh, just 7.1% of American comp sci jobs were occupied by foreign-born workers. That share grew to about uh, almost 30% by 2010 uh, because of the breakneck growth in the tech sector, uh, which became increasingly reliant on high-skilled visa-holding immigrants. And unfortunately, President Trump's immigration policies have made it harder for tech companies to bring highly skilled workers into the U.S. For example, in March uh, 2017, the U.S. CIS announced that entry-level computer programmers would no longer automatically qualify uh, to apply for the visa programs. And, but instead of this meaning that more jobs will actually be filled by Americans, it has turned out that it's just more likely now that companies will send the work overseas. Uh, where there are, you know, employees that are eligible to work. The, the problem is that there just are not enough trained Americans to fill the growing demand of, of, of computer jobs generally. Um, so uh, in response to this, last year I introduced the Keep STEM Talent Act to provide permanent resident status to international students who completed advanced STEM degrees in the U.S. institutions and are interested in continuing their research in the U.S. Um, I believe we should be encouraging these young scientists to remain in the U.S. and join the American scientific and cybersecurity workforces. Uh, so, Ms. Miller, how reliant is IBM on foreign talent and computer scientists, and are there instances when you've actually had to move work offshore simply because of the shortage of, of the cyber talent in the U.S.? Well, IBM Security specifically is operating in over 130 countries, so we have talent all over the world. Um, we do rely to some degree on um, bring talent into the U.S., but it could be everything from the experience, you know, so cross-training or the experience that they bring from someplace else to train people here, um, or we're grooming them and we're, you know, they go back to their home country. So there's a variety of what reasons why we may rely on it. I don't think we have an over abundance of reliance on that, but that's one of the reasons why in the U.S. we're so focused on the skills first approach to um, really bringing in more cybersecurity professionals from here, grooming that talent, providing a lot of resources to help, uh, free resources, uh, curriculums on uh, badges, external digital badges that people can, uh, uh, people can attain to, to demonstrate their proficiency and other tools so that we have the talent here and we're continuing to groom that talent. So that's our main focus. It's not to bring the talent from other countries necessarily, but to grow the talent here. And the new collar approach that we're taking is helping us do that. Now, if you look at future needs in cybersecurity, uh, you know, something like half of all cybersecurity instances have to do with someone impersonating someone else online. Mm -hmm. And so that a lot of the reason that you're focusing on soft skills is to train people simply to operate their authentication properly. You know? And um, there are uh, interesting proposals out there uh, that the federal government allow um, allow citizens who want a means to digitally authenticate themselves online. Um, so this would, in its simplest form, would be uh, simply, you know, if you get a real ID card, you're also given a digital means to assert that ID. Uh, and so that is something that I know a lot of industry is in, enthusiastic about being able to add onto. Uh, it's it, part of the way of making sure that you don't have identity fraud, which is, you know, the biggest single um, you know, component of, of cyber insecurity in our country. And so this is going to have a big impact if uh, people have good technical means to 
to authenticate themselves. And is that going to really change the nature of the cybersecurity workforce so that you'll be more focused on you know, device security, program security, rather than uh, training people to uh, feed the systems properly? Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm qualified to actually comment on that. What I will tell you is that um, in the cybersecurity space, um, cyber criminals, they continue to evolve and it's hard to keep up with them. Um, we were kind of joking yesterday that we wish we understood the workforce strategy of, of these threat actors and how they're finding such um, uh, you know, great talent that's out there making us have to keep up, making us have to continue to chase and understand what they're doing. But I, I can't uh, comment specifically on what technology um, and the, the effect. Yeah, well, well, that's what makes it so tough mm -hmm. for STEM training generally. You know, I think 15 years ago we were trying to teach all kids to learn HTML so they could, um, you know, maintain their own web pages, right. and now, uh, you know, we've got three billion web page maintainers who maintain their Facebook page, and it's <laughs> and the nature of technology right. is that the training is when you're planning 15 years out. Now, uh, just a last point, if I could, about the national labs. You know, as I mentioned a few times on this committee, I'm a proud uh, co-chair of the National Labs Caucus, and we're visiting all 17 of the DOE labs. We just finished a visited, visiting Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, so, Dr. Siraj, in your testimony, you highlighted that Tennessee Tech uh, University faculty and graduate students have been conducting research with the scientists and engineers at Oak Ridge National Lab and on various DOE-funded research projects. Projects. Could you just say a few words about that? Um, so the way it came about, because you know Oak Ridge National Lab is just one hour um, uh, away from us, and um, so we have a couple of faculty um, in computer science who are working with a couple of groups in uh, Oak Ridge National Lab to work on um, security research projects that I mentioned in my testimony. Plus, we also have partnership where um, professionals there who don't have PhD degree, they're working, they're um, going into doctoral studies at our school, and our faculty are also going there to um, teach security classes. There are professionals also coming to our campus to teach security classes. But, you know, this partnership is, you know, it's a win-win situation for both the entities, for the National Lab, and for us, for our students, it provides you know ex um, big opportunity to speak to this scientist and the role models and learn from them because you know what professors know. So. Yeah, well, yeah, one of my favorite events of, of the year is to go to Argonne National Lab in my district, which hosts uh, the DOE-sponsored cyber security contest yes. where the cyber force competition. Cyber force competitions where where college teams come in from all over the country and try to hack each other's equipment, yes. and so, it's a it's a lot of fun. And you're right, they do enjoy interacting with yes. the scientists. So there. our anyway, students my, do that too. Yeah, I think my time has expired, so I will yield back. Okay, Dr. Baird, you'll be recognized for five more minutes of questioning. Dr. Peterson, last May, the President Trump issued an America's Cybersecurity Workforce Executive Order, which directed the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of Homeland Security, along with the heads of other appropriate agencies, to implement the recommendations from their 2017 report on how to support growth and sustainment of the nation's cybersecurity workforce in both the public and the private sectors. So. Could you tell us if you're involved in implementing these recommendations, and if so, how? And uh, are these recommendations informing the development of NICE's strategic plan for the next five years? Yeah, thank you for that question. We are absolutely involved, as we were in both the development of the recommendations as well as the implementation. There were five imperatives, multiple recommendations and actions, and beginning by prioritizing some of them. So, for example, the first one spoke to having a national call for action to make sure that both the public and private sector were recognizing the importance of cybersecurity. And by way of example, another reason that I've worked closely with IBM is several companies have come together as part of the Aspen Cybersecurity Group to issue a set of principles that they want companies to follow. And one of those principles is to use the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, but other principles are things like career discovery or doing skills-based hiring and the like. And so working collaboratively with the, the private sector and industry in this case to raise the importance and elevate this is one way that we're implementing it. Uh, when I talked earlier about transforming the learning process, including more of a focus on skills and less on just uh, traditional 
professional credentials. That's another example of an emerging theme in, in our next strategic plan. Uh, we're learning, as many of you have described, includes not only the K through 12, the high school diploma, the community college, college degree, but also certifications or apprenticeships or the other multiple pathways to a career in cybersecurity. Uh, and finally, as I indicated, the Workforce Policy Advisory Board, which is part of that President's National Council on America's Workforce, will be talking more about the multiple pathways to all types of careers, but cybersecurity especially, where it could be that transitioning veteran that you described earlier that after a 20-year military career then enters cybersecurity, or it could be an IT worker who's going to you know, transition to a cybersecurity role. So we are actively working on both prioritizing and implementing them to the extent that we can. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller, one last question. Uh, me. Uh, you know, could you elaborate on how IBM has utilized their apprenticeship program and, and uh, how you use that to recruit and retain cybersecurity workforce? Sure. Um, so we started the apprenticeship program about four years ago. And uh, what we do is we've actually, especially in the security, the cybersecurity organizations, have really looked at what are the right roles that we can really bring in talent without the four-year degree. So looking at the soft skills, making sure that they have those right critical skills, um, and leading with skills first and uh, the capabilities over the credentials, right? Um, and then looking at what are the right roles to bring them in. So a security operations um, center analyst is one, pen testers. Uh, another example, technical writers. We've been bringing people in into those types of positions um, as a, a way to, um, to one, test them, make sure that they, can, that they have the, the technical capabilities as we continue to train them up, sponsor them for certifications, et cetera. So as they come in, there is a curriculum that's built out for the first year for them that they go through and dedicated resources to support them. So it's really looking at this from a, a skills first um, basis and it allows us to get the, um, you know, those that have four-year degrees, um, they tend to not be representative of the overall U.S. population demographically, right? So if we're able to bring in um, and really leverage the, the P-TECH programs, the apprenticeship programs, et cetera, we're able to get into, tap into that underrepresented talent, whether it be based on rage, um, gender, um, even veterans, et cetera. So this is definitely a way that, and I, the question was asked earlier, this is a way that in the future, people will be able to look up and see people that look like them at the top of the house. So it's very important to us. Thank you, and I see I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. Um, and now we'll recognize Dr. Lipinski for five minutes of question. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you for uh, holding this, this hearing. We all know how important this uh, issue is, and unfortunately, it um, doesn't receive nearly as much attention as it should. Uh, happy to follow uh, the Democrat before me, Bill Foster. We share Argonne National Lab and uh, appreciate the great work that's being, uh, being done there on cybersecurity. Uh, one particular issue I have is uh, how medium and small manufacturers struggle to keep up with the rapid evolution of cyber attacks. It's something I hear about all the time from uh, these manufacturers in, in my district. I was the uh, Democratic lead on the NIST Small Business Cybersecurity Act, which was signed into law in 2018. Uh, the bill directed NIST to develop voluntary guidelines to help small businesses identify, manage, and reduce cybersecurity risks. NIST has since developed the Small Business Cybersecurity Corner to provide resources on this topic to small businesses. So I want to ask uh, Mr. Peterson, can you describe the National Initiative for Cyber Education's contributions uh, to these resources for small businesses? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we actually have one of our team members, our small team that is um, assigned part-time to help support the small and medium business outreach. Um, one is because her regular role with NICE is to do industry engagement. And again, we want to be sensitive to both the need of large enterprises as well as small and medium businesses. So she can bring both that expertise as well as um, kind of introduce workforce and education related topics into that small and medium business outreach. Uh, the reality is, talk about a small team like my own, the small and medium businesses have smaller teams, especially devoted to IT and cybersecurity, and, and are often reliant on third-party providers, service providers as well. So making sure that 
for example, our nice cybersecurity workforce framework doesn't just speak to the kind of workforce they need, but the kind of workforce that service providers need to bring to them as well as a way we try to translate that for small to medium businesses. Thank you. I want to follow up on that, um, looking more uh, generally at uh, bolstering cybersecurity education and, and manufacturing. Uh, in 2018, the administration put out the strategy for American leadership in advanced manufacturing. Uh, this was the result of a, a bill that um, uh, I had uh, written that uh, this committee had passed. It, it was passed in a law. And so it, it, that strategy talks specifically about bolstering cybersecurity education manufacturing. So in response, the Department of Defense launched a National Center for Cybersecurity and Manufacturing in 2018 at MXD, uh, which is in Chicago. Uh, the center focuses on ensuring small, medium-sized manufacturers are taking the necessary precautions to protect themselves from cyber attacks and subsequent data breaches and IP theft. So, Mr. Peterson, I want to ask, as you've discussed in your testimony, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education is beginning the process of updating their five-year strategic plan. So how will the framework leverage work done at manufacturing institutes like the Cybersecurity Center at MXD to accelerate and enhance NIST cybersecurity workforce development? So one of the roles that NICE plays is being aware of the ecosystem that's happening across the U.S., not only geographically, but by critical infrastructure sectors or other economic sectors. And NIST also, as you know, is home to the Manufacturing Extension Partnership that helps to administer some of the um, manufacturing um, programs across the U.S. And so fortunately, in the context of my relationship with the NIST MEP office, they brought the workforce program of MDX to our attention, and we have engaged with them directly. Um, primarily as they go down a path of developing a workforce framework for manufacturing to create a skilled cybersecurity workforce to recognize that the NICE cybersecurity workforce framework is a resource to them. Uh, it's a reference resource upon which all the critical infrastructure sectors can leverage and modify and adapt to meet their needs. Uh, but also we're trying to create a standardized environment across the nation uh, for cybersecurity work that can help education and training providers as well as employers to have that common taxonomy. So I'm glad to say we've worked with them very collaboratively and trying to encourage them to use our existing framework as a foundation for what they do. But secondly, as you indicate, both as we update our NICE framework and our next strategic plan, then any feedback or input that they have to provide to us that we're more than happy to receive that as well. We did just complete a request for comment period and, you know, are going to be looking at the comments received as a way to collect that public input. Thank you, and I want to uh, thank you, Mr. Peterson, and all of our witnesses uh, today for uh, your testimony, but also for your continued work on this uh, very, uh, very critical issue. I'll yield back. Thank you, Dr. Lipinski, um, and and I second your your comments of, of gratitude. So many amazing things that we touched on um, in just this ninety minute period, uh, Dr. Siraj, your your statements of. Anyone can be in cybersecurity. Anyone can solve these problems and this, this cross-functionality uh, and this real place of opportunity for growth. Uh, obviously, a lot going on in, in Congress today, but this uh, is submitted for the official record, and our record is going to remain open for, for a couple of weeks for additional statements from members or questions that they might have, so those might come your way as well, and we're going to keep the the conversation rolling as as well as um, the commitment that Congress will continue to serve as an effective steward and partner uh, in filling our workforce needs, um, uh, getting rid of the mistrust and obviously the, the risk that not only impacts our, uh, our, uh, our national security, our financial security, our, our over for individuals and our overall economy. And it's a job opportunity for us as well to, to promote the cybersecurity workforce. So thank you all so much. The witnesses are now excused and the hearing is adjourned. I I was uh, with some you know APEX during the board meeting, right?